My name is Gabriel Melendez, Director of the Center for Regional Studies at the University of New Mexico. I would like to welcome you all to one of our programs in the La Canoa Legacy Series, a partnership between the National Hispanic Cultural Center and the Center for Regional Studies. The Center for Regional Studies is dedicated to the creation and dissemination of knowledge about New Mexico, the greater Southwest as a region, and its connections to Northern Mexico, Latin America, and the Iberian Peninsula. The La Canoa Legacy Series takes its inspiration from the word canoa. A canoa is a sloop-rigged fishing boat common in the Amazon, but in New Mexico it is the name of some common everyday tools, a simple canal or flute, or the wooden paddle a baker uses to move loaves of bread in and out of a hot oven. Always La Canoa receives and transports people and resources. And we want these talks to transport us and move the conversation between presenters and audience members back and forth in rich dialogue. We also want our talks to bring practical, useful information to community members, researchers, and others interested in the history, culture, politics, sociology, and religious experiences of our region. So I gave you a little bit of, of a taste of what we're going to talk about today. Um, but first of all, I'd like to maybe define, you know, cultural heritage and how I applied it to um, the framework that we're going to talk about today. So um, what it means is, you know, what we inherit from the past and, and what we pass on from generation to generation. Um, not just monuments, art, artifacts, but all the expressions of our ways of living, including traditions, languages, rituals, and foods. So where did I start with this topic, and why did I get so passionate about it? Well, I happen to love cooking, so, and I love New Mexico cookbooks, um, and I, I really love how we pre have preserved our foods over all these years. Um, so I actually collect them. Um, there are very few cookbooks that have been written um, by native New Mexicans. Um, because most of all of our foods are sort of passed down from one generation to another through oral, you know, oral history. Um, and I think that one cookbook that I did find um, was the earliest that we had was 1940. So this book here was written by Anna Pacheco, who happens to be a well-known writer in New Mexico. She put together a lot of different um, recipes from many different families. And, and what, I, what I did is I went through all of the recipes to find foods that I felt were going to be jeopardized by climate change. And I was just shocked, really, to find that many of the ingredients um, will be or have been affected you know, by the temperature changes that we'll be seeing and the wildfires that we will be seeing. Um, and, also, I don't know if you know this, but only 90% of our food consumed today, um, it, it all comes from out of state. So we're not even growing our food anymore. We're trying to make progress. The New Mexico State University Agricultural um, Department has done a great job of, of um, sort of helping us get there where we can begin to start growing our own food. Um, but you know, all of the recipes that I knew as a child, all of the ingredients, you know, we buy in the store, and I don't really know where they come from. So um, that, that in itself is sort of the ripping away or, or taking away of some of the culture that, that we've had all these years. Um, so where the other place this began, this topic began, um, was with the Union of Concerned Scientists when I was working in, like in a working group of um, all kinds of, um, of professionals, from archaeologists to um, preservationists, you know, all sorts of professions that really felt like heritage needed to be a part of the dialogue when we talked about climate change. Uh, so what they did is they produced, they wrote this book <clears throat> called The Future of Our Past, Emerging Cultural Heritage in Climate Action. So it's a book about, or it's a, it's a guide, 
<clears throat> that will help prof professionals understand how to um, how to move forward in understanding how to preserve our heritage. Um, it is not specific to <clears throat> to New Mexico. It just is a sort of a general framework. So the talk that I put together today is based on the framework that they used. Um, so the working group um, is a quite interesting group of people um, that tend to live in areas where there's a lot of oceanfront. They live in highly populated areas, um, and, and they're mostly concerned about sea level rise. So here in New Mexico, we have a different problem. We don't, we don't have sea level rise. We have loss of our water resources, and we have wildfires. Those are going to be our two big um, multipliers. <clears throat> so just a few points to make about climate change. Um, it has become one of the most significant and fastest growing threats to people and their cultural heritage world worldwide. So it needed, it needed this group to really come out and, and broadcast you know, to scientists and to professionals that we need to pay attention to this. So scientific evidence does show that, you know, unprecedented concentrations of greenhouse gases, you know, driven by human activities, such as burning of fossil fuels and deforestation, are contributing to climate changes, including warming of the oceans and atmosphere, sea level rise, and diminished snow and ice, which is impacting us here in New Mexico. We're not, we will not see the kind of snow that we had last year. That was, that pattern, that weather pattern um, is very different. What we will see is less snow, less of a snowpack, therefore will threaten our water supply. So the impact of these changes are already damaging infrastructure, ecosystems, and social systems, including cultural heritage that provide essential benefits and quality of life to our communities. So this will sort of give you an overview of, of how New Mexico will, will see this, this thing called climate change. Um, I did give you a handout that looks like this. And if you didn't get one, I'll give one to you after the talk. But this is a great overview of really what's happening here. And this was a piece that was published by the Union of Concerned Scientists um, with my, my help to be able to get all of the information um, and the collaborations um, with our academics to be able to publish this for policymakers. So that's what that piece is all about. So what exactly is at risk? So I, I sort of made a list here. Um, you know, loss of plants and trees, uh, cultural landscapes, historical buildings, um, the erosion and heavy rain and wildfires, uh, the erosion actually coming from, from sort of an after wildfire effect or impact, um, plants and natural materials, relied on by traditional craftsmen, um, traditional varieties of crops. Um, and you can see that it's a pretty wide variety of, of at-risk um, things that we have, to, we have to pay attention to. It takes a lot of people to, to manage all those risks. Um, so buildings and structures. Um, we won't be talking a lot about buildings and structures. Um, however, um, we have to, you know, we really have to protect them because they protect the archives. They protect our artifacts. Um, we have a lot of old buildings. We have, you know, many of our Native American communities that have housing that is very near forest, forested areas. 
So some of these impacts that we are feeling right now, um, this just isn't tomorrow, this is happening right now. Large scale human displacement and migration, loss of existing communities, flooding, um, desertification, which is happening here in New Mexico, wind damage, wildfires, major changes to cityscapes, landscapes, and all types of heritage buildings, sites, and places. Drought, which we are feeling here in New Mexico, um, and a worldwide trend from rural to urban populations. So we will lose populations in the rural areas. That, that is a given. That is going to happen. It's happening right now in New Mexico. So some of our cultural assets. This is a f the fire that happened. This was four or five years ago. And you can see how close it was uh, to the Taos Pueblo. Um, I'm going to start naming off all of what we hold precious. Um, and somewhere in our lives, we either are near this tree or we use the pinon from the tree. We smell it. It's part of our lives. And it has been for generations. So we will see a decrease in the pinon population. And that is because of this little worm. Um, higher temperatures year-round and more frost-free days during winter mean an increase uh, in stress on plants, making them more vulnerable to agricultural pests and diseases. Um, so this little worm got into our pinon population in New Mexico, and there are parts of New Mexico that look like this. And this is nice firewood for some wildfire that just is just waiting right there um, to take over um, a whole, you know, a whole mountaintop. Um, so this is, this is happening right now. <laughs> um, another piece of the, of the pinon uh, tree is our cultural memory of our relationship with the pinon nut. Um, I, I have a, a really short YouTube video of an example of a Navajo family that um, uses the pinon nut. It's a part of their ritual. Um, and it, it has been a part of our rituals for generations. I don't think there would be a lot of pine pickers anymore. My name is Shanna Yazi. I am Navajo, full-blooded Navajo, and I am from Cameron, Arizona. The history behind the pine nuts is a long time ago. Pine nuts, this was a good source of protein and it's also good for as a medicinal use for bone joints, I believe, if you eat it raw. Elders such as my grandmother and her relatives would come out from Cameron on a wagon and they would go up the mountain. They, they traveled as a family and they would go with their relatives. They would pitch a tent under the trees. They would make an area for the cooking and the women usually went out and just sat under trees and picked. The picking process is very simple. There are different types of pinions that fall from the cones here. And the thing about it is you want it to naturally fall. There is taboos, Navajo taboos, about shaking or hitting the pine nuts to forcefully have it fall down. They say if you do that, it will create early winter so it shortens your pinion picking gathering, which not everybody wants, because you have a large forest that you can pick from. You always want to go for the darker ones. The lighter ones are the thinner shelled and most likely empty, and that's not fun when you're cracking because you're so excited to eat the nut and there's nothing in there. 
These are the pinus that we collected from the south rim of Grand Canyon. Um, this takes about a day of picking for myself. So what we do is we get some water, put it in a bowl, and then we just wash. And I've learned that to make it a lot cleaner, I use baking soda to clean it out. Because when you're picking under the tree, you come across this, the, the webs and the, the deer. After that, we just pretty much drain the water. And we're gonna go out to the fire pit. I will show you how to roast it from there. We're roasting the shell and the pine inside. And you're just gonna constantly stir it. So sometimes raw pine nuts um, don't taste as good as the cooked pine nuts. The salt kind of brings it up more flavor and it's roasted so it's more edible. And so this is what it looks like once it's done roasted. It's just the generation is getting into more modern technology and a lot of our elderly, the most traditional ones, this is their last decade here. So now we're slowly getting into modern technology and we're not really appreciative of our native foods that's available. But if you have a family, a family member that can remember this and really make it fun, I'm sure there will be at least one or two families, maybe a lot more families out there that would be really appreciative of the pine picking. So I was so happy to find that that oral history there because that just explains the importance of the pinon. Um, just a simple fruit, like just has the significance um, for Hispanic families, for um, Native Americans, and, and also really anybody that moves to New Mexico learns about the pinon. Um, so I couldn't remember the name of the, the bug that is infiltrated these pinon trees. Um, it's the bark beetle. So it, it's, a, it's a beetle, and there's really, and, and it will come upon us when we have a drought. So if we have a good winter, um, you know, they don't have time to spawn and, and move from one tree to another. They, they won't survive. So that's why it's important to really have wet winters so that um, cold, we need wet and cold is what we, really what we need. Um, so we are concerned. We are we are going to lose a part of part of our history. Um, I know you don't want to talk about this one, but this is um, our prized chili crop, and we have many crops. Um, however, we they're threatened because we are not able to supply the kind of water that they've been used to. So our water supply has been, has been jeopardized. Um, there's less of it, and some scientists are saying that we're going to have about 30% less water um, as an everyday, something that we have to live with every single day. So our, there's a gap between our water supply and what we actually need to supply our crops. So most of all of our water goes to agriculture, most of all of it, almost 70, anywhere between 70 to 78 percent, I believe, goes to, goes to water, watering our crops. And most of these crops are not staying here. They're selling, they're, they're leaving here, they're going somewhere else. So that's definitely a concern. 
Um, this is how complicated our chili industry has become. Um, so there are, like I said, there are many different types of chilies. Um, but you can see that, that, that this is a whole industry. And it certainly, uh, we talk about it a lot, that you know, we need to preserve you know, our red chili, that we don't need to buy it from Colorado or from Texas or from Mexico. Um, and this is why, because we have invested millions and millions of dollars in this industry. And we need to assure that we have enough water so that we can, you know, we can hold true to this tradition. Um, the other tree that I'm concerned about is our cottonwoods. So you go up and down the, bo the bosque and you see dead cottonwood trees. Um, there'll, become a, there'll be a time when we won't have cottonwood trees. We value our cottonwood trees because we, you know, we paint them, we sit with them, we enjoy the landscape. Um, and I know we're going to miss them, but there will come a time when we will no longer have cottonwoods. They take an enormous amount of water right out of the river. And we don't have the water to spare. Um, so water is our most precious resource. Um, some of you might know um, what our acequia system is all about. Um, this is a very historic way of distributing water to our, to our communities that are using the water for crops. Um, uh, if, we, if our water supply is threatened, so are our acequias. Acequias are a very important preservation of our ecosystem and very important to, um, to our water supply because it's a very effective way to water crops. Um, it's even more effective than, than trying to put drip irrigation in. Um, so we really need to make sure that our acequias are preserved. Um, you may not know about the Southwest mega drought. Um, scientists are forecasting that we have entered that space where we will see a drought that will last or could last a thousand years. Um, we have seen this before. Um, we were not around. Um, and we'll see it again, but this one is different because this one is caused by greenhouse gases and the power that oil and gas have over our world economy is, is just, um, it's hard to take. And this is what's driving us in this direction. Um, I want to talk about this um, tradition. So this is this is Zobra, and I grew up with Zobra. Um, I don't necessarily like Zazobra, but um, I have my <laughs> reservations on whether or not it's really part of our tradition here in New Mexico. Um, but I want to talk about it from a, an environmental standpoint. Um, so we, they, they, they host Zazobra in Santa Fe near a forested area. And just about everyone in a political position in Santa Fe know that we have to be really careful with any fires that we decide to light near the forested area. And yet they still continue to ignore that, you know, that this tradition um, in our world today may not be relevant. So, the, and I'm probably the only person that might be saying this, but um, you know, I wouldn't miss it. I wouldn't miss that it would if it would leave us because of an environmental concern. 
Um, but just having this one event once a year could wipe out an entire community. Um, so what is climate science telling? What is it telling us? Um, so it's telling us that we need to adapt um, and we need mitigation strategies. Um, what climate science cannot tell us is what adaptation options are most workable within any given human system. That's up to us. Cultural heritage is a source of creativity and inspiration that can answer this question, including shaping the acceptability of policy of system change. So this is where it gets complicated because not, not every policymaker sees that cultural heritage uh, should be factored in to the policy making. So that's the hard part. So the other um, piece of this, of this framework when we think about cultural heritage and climate change is building social resistance. Re resilience. Mon so here I just threw out some examples. Um, monitoring and recording of heritage at risk. We, we need to do this. This is important. Um, cultural heritage inventories and participatory cultural mapping initiatives serving as a knowledge gathering process as well as a platform for civilization mobilization. Traditional approaches, just some examples of that, are traditional approaches like oral histories and new technologies like using GIS. Um, community engagement, participation, and um, empowerment involving the transfer of androgynous ways of knowing. Um, examples of that, places um, communities at the heart um, really, com communities are at the heart, sh or should be at the heart of their own decision-making process. That's what's going to preserve the culture, is, is, is that important um, voice. Acknowledges and respects traditional rights, and puts values of communities at the core of the response and treats cultural heritage as an asset. And I think that's where it gets complicated because they don't see cultural heritage as an asset. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about climate equity and climate justice. Um, so as you know, we are having massive um, migration from either climate change or wars, or a combination of the two. And wherever you see war, you see drought you see drought. Um, climate justice links human rights and development to achieve a human-centered approach to climate action, safeguarding the rights of the most vulnerable, taking into account the needs of those at greatest risk, particularly the poorest and the most vulnerable, and sharing the burdens and benefits of climate change and their resolution in an equitable and just manner. So I wanted to give you an example of um, something that's happening right now. So this is Angora, Turkey. And it's been in the news lately. And it just so happened that this image came to me just a few days ago from a friend of mine that's a, um, a climate sort of social worker in Turkey. And what she does is she helps protect um, uh, migrants from being used as labor. And they are using children, children this age. She was, she was in this camp when she shot this. And it's just a, a, just a sad situation in Turkey right now. So there are... 2.5 million uh, immigrants coming from Syria into Turkey. So uh, they are housing 
2.5 million of these families. And these are women and children, like whole families living in these camps. And uh, they just, they're being used for labor. They're, they didn't even integrate them into society. They're just plopping them in these places just to serve as labor, laborers for these, you know, for, the, for this, for this agriculture, for the, they call them agricultural settlements. Um, so she's put there to, uh, to police it. And apparently the UN has policies against this, but Turkey is refusing to, uh, you know, to exercise what the UN is, is calling for. So I was just disturbed by this whole story. I just thought I would mention it. Um, and it, you know, it, it's an example of, you, know, you take these families and they're moving into these other countries. They don't understand the culture. They, they don't come with, you know, with their homeland. They, they're just plopped there and they're expected to just work. They have, no, they don't, they can't move their culture. So what are the solutions? Um, what can we do here in New Mexico? Um, so a good place to start is with conservation. Um, uh, one example is simple monitoring of change to provide data that can be used to achieve accountability and governance. Oops, let me go back here. I'm going too fast. Um, building maintenance and conservation um, into, into the practices of really any historical building or site. Um, prepare for losses and damages. Um, understand the carbon footprint of the resource, resources being managed. Assessment tools such as there's a life, life cycle analysis that could be done. Cultural landscape, living or past need adaptation planning adopted as part of urban policies. So again, it, it comes back to policies, strong policies. So climate action, how can historians um, heritage practitioners, scholars, educators, and civil society have a central role and urgent responsibility to support communities in safeguarding and advocating for the important roles of cultural heritage in climate action. So that is the end of my, my talk. And I know it might be maybe is, have you heard something like this before? Is this, is this something that you've been introduced to? Um, I would love to hear from you and love to know your feedback and are there ways that you know that New Mexico can continue to pr preserve its beautiful heritage? <laughs> oh, go ahead. Um. Several years ago, I worked with Esteban Adriano. I don't know if you're familiar with him. And he did a lot of work in the past, and working with me. Um, as far as, I don't know, climate change, but as far as preserving culture. And um, I, I worked with the preservation of, of our Spanish language in New Mexico. And I remember him telling me that one of the things one of the reasons why we're losing the language is because we are no longer tied to the agricultural, to agriculture, yeah. and that most of our language began with agricultural terms, or, or so much of our culture is invested in that process. And so when our young, um, when our families moved into the cities, into the urban areas, you know, we, we became removed from, from the, the language. And so trying to preserve, conserve the language, as I've been working for, for many years, it's very difficult because when you're working with urban students, they have not ever been anywhere where they've grown their own food or they don't know most of this information. 
And so um, being able to, to include that type of learning for students, whether it's in schools or in the homes and that, how do we connect the rural and the urban and using language also to start educating about climate change and how it is affecting us. Um, and so much of preservation of culture is in the language. It is. Yes, I agree. It is. And this shift, the trend that we're going to have now where rural communities are going to get smaller and urban areas are going to get larger, there's, there's an example right there. Um, but it, it's also, I know that this is more water, <laughs> more water science here, but um, our Secchia system to me is one of the most important heritage points that we have in the state because if we can keep the Asekias alive and keep the lands alive, then we can keep the language alive and the stories um, and the foods and the traditions. Um, and that's why our, our policymakers really have to get that you know, our Asekia system is just so important. It's, it's so important. Um, and, you know, we're now, kind of, we're now upon a time where families are passing their land on to the next generation. And the next generation doesn't necessarily want to be a farmer. So, you know, they, they, they sell the house to someone and they build something on it, but they may not use and ex access the, ex the Asekia you know, to keep the land healthy, to keep the soil healthy. So it's all, it's complicated, isn't it? It's just, it's just this human system that is, that is very complex. So I'm, 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 I'm hopeful that, 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 that we will find ways to preserve our, our heritage as climate change progresses. We're not going back. We can't go back. It, it is what it is. We've, the damage has been done already. We can't just suck it out of the air. We just can't suck it out of the air. You can try. I think they are trying to do that, carbon catch, capture. They're trying to suck it out of the air. And it's just not going to happen. It, it just, it's not that simple. So we need to adapt. I think that that is my message today. We need to adapt. And we need to help um, our families adapt and our, our neighborhoods adapt. I mean, people that you know, friends that you know, um, that's helpful. Um, if you feel like you can't do anything about it, that's something that you can do, is that you can talk to your friends and your family. And you can vote for people who believe that, um, that, that we've really made some horrible mistakes and that we need to fix it all. <laughs> oh, go ahead. I appreciate, first of all, you bringing and tying this back to our culture. Uh, I, I guess I, I hadn't really paid much attention to it, and I'm glad you made me more aware of that. Uh, the other part, the question I have though is uh, how much of what you're doing today is being recognized, particularly by those policymakers? Because a lot of the things that we're seeing today are immediate. So, Zobra, that's just to bring people to Santa Fe on a particular day to make more money. Um, you know, natural gas and all of that, that's, those are all kind of temporary things that bring revenue. So, and, and politicians a lot of times are very much aware of that idea of now, but how much do you see an interest from politicians today to accept this idea about how the climate is affecting our culture uh, in, in general? Um, I think that um, there are certain political leaders who are 
maybe they're aware of it on, you know, just sort of living their day-to-day life. Um, if they're connected to a community that heritage is important, as an example, a Native American leader, they, they have already plans in place to mitigate and to adapt to climate change because their culture is so important to them that they know what wildlife they need, they know how much water they need, they know what crops they need. They have control over that because it's their land, uh, sovereign land, um, so they're better, pre actually better prepared to preserve their culture than we are prepared living in an urban area. Um, rural communities, um, I would rank them second and their leaders um, because they're more connected to the land. So the further away you move from the land and into the urban area, the less connected you are to your culture. And that's true to what, that kind of points back to what you were saying about language. So. Yeah, so, so the question becomes one that uh, if, if you have people in more rural communities and you have uh, people particularly on say Navajo, um, Hopi reservations or indigenous reservations, how do you bring those people or politicians along to that idea when you have people in Farmington who are, are involved in the natural gas industry and that's their livelihood? How do you bring them along to understand the, the importance of what's happening in our more rural areas where, you know, we, that, that kind of, it seems to me it needs to happen because there's almost two different kinds of people, right? Yeah, their value system is, is, is obviously very different. So they're going to protect their economic interests in their, in their city. Um, and the only way to bring along somebody that has an economic interest is to connect economic interest into heritage. And that's where our chili crop pops up and, you know, some other things that we make money with. Oh, uh, pecans. <laughs> pecans use an enormous amount of water. You would die if you knew. Um, oh, go ahead. Tell them what's going to happen to their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. They'll think a little differently. They I hope they do. I think that, you know, we're hoping that our this next generation that's coming up um, will be a little bit more um, forceful in, in the way that the choices that, you know, have been made. Um, we hope that we'll go back, we'll be able to have 100% renewable energy by, by 2030 here in New Mexico. Um, I think the next generation is the generation that will change everything. I think this generation, the baby boomers, I think that we have really, we have really, really made it a, a terrible we were, we're, we're a terrible example. Um, so the next generation coming up, I have hope for. I do. I'm thinking of our modern urban culture disappearing too, because you visit ancient sites, the ancient Greek, the ancient Roman, and Chaco Canyon, etc. and all over the world, you see uh, urban sites that were very uh, prosperous and energetic at one time and cosmopolitan, they're now in ruins. And largely it's because they used up the resources and uh, failed to allocate resources uh, for the future. Yeah. And, and so I'm thinking of coming back to Albuquerque a thousand years from now and seeing a few towers sticking out of the stand and nothing else here. You know, I mean, it's entirely possible that, we, yeah. that Albuquerque will look like Chaco Canyon in a few thousand years. And, and uh, 
So, I mean, our modern um, cosmopolitan urban culture is, uh, well, and being in the home building industry, I'm sure you're quite aware of yeah. the zoning problems. There's zoning problems everywhere. Yeah. I know, and I think that what I'm worried about in the urban area is not having enough infrastructure planning to prepare for all the flooding. That's what I worry about. Because just one flood can just wipe out this whole area, and this area is right by the Bosque. So, and there could be fire right here just waiting to happen. So that's what I worry about, that, that our policymakers have not, aren't, aren't thinking about planning for infrastructure for the future. And, and you see uh, cities in uh, Europe, for example, or in Asia, that have that are still vital after hundreds of years. And uh, compared to American cities, you see that they're much more compact. Yes. And uh, so, you know, we may have to give up living in single-family homes and driving cars and having shopping centers and things like that. Yeah, walking more. Yeah, definitely, definitely. There's lots of room to grow, and I think the next generation, they're going to have different values because they may not even be able to afford to buy houses because the real estate has just gotten so expensive. So, you know, there is concern for our, the next generation, but, but I actually have hope for them. I think they're well aware of, you know, what, what's happening. There is one last question. Sure. Is there, is there <laughs> curriculum being developed to take this into the schools, you know, particularly for elementary, junior high school, high school students to become more aware of this? Oh, this, this, that's a really good question. This, uh, this tie between uh, our climate change and our, and our heritage and our culture. Because that seems to be the place where, like you say, then you have some hope for the future. Yeah, then you, yeah, because you're training the, the younger ones. Um, that's an interesting question. Um, there was an effort, I think it was last year, um, to take climate change out of the public school system. Just the word climate change, not even have it mentioned. And there was a big fight to actually, they, you know, they lost, they lost. Um, uh, you know, therefore it has to be taught. And the way that you teach climate change is through conservation classes. So that, that's quite helpful because it, the approach is a little bit different. You know, they, it's more hands-on, you know, they get to learn about, you know, um, how to plant a garden. Um, how to care for it, you know, how to grow your own food. Um, that's how the information comes to them. But just as a solid science um, class, that, that's, it's, it's really hard to teach a hard science like that to um, elementary students. Um, so the way you approach it really is through conservation. Oh, <laughs> either one. Well, one thing I wanted to say about that is that uh, it seems to me social studies classes should, that's where it should be taught in terms of what you're talking about. Because one of the things that you said that struck me so much today with you is that artisans or artists won't have the materials that they need to continue to make art that is sort of, you know, associated with culture. So it seems to me that What's ironic is that we worry about young people being less connected to their culture, right? So even though we've made lots of mistakes as boomers, um, the next generation we have hope for, but they're less connected to culture sometimes, especially in urban areas. So it seems to me that in a social study, having a social studies curriculum where you make this parallel between maybe even the loss of language and how that's a loss of culture and the loss of loss of cultural heritage because we lose the things that, well, the loss of cultural heritage due to climate change 
is losing our connection to these kind of essential elements of culture. To me, that's like a social studies mm -hmm. curriculum. Um, it's, it's not that it isn't related to science, right? It's really sort of an interdisciplinary uh, field, right? Yeah, exactly. Or it could even be taught through a civics class. I know that's sort of another, if there's such a thing, you're right. You know, because if they learn, you know, about civics, then they learn about movements. You know, like, well, there's a climate change movement happening right now. They need to understand what that means. What does that mean? Oh, and then, oh. let me get her and then. You just mentioned that I know in Taos, they do, uh, they're working with the young students in the high school where they work on the acequias. And I truly believe that until you, you can incorporate, I don't think it has to be a social, uh, I would call it different specific classes. I think you can do it in almost any class, mm -hmm. either whether it's, uh, even in Spanish classes we do that, you put your hands on, uh, taking them on, on um, weekend trips to, to visit the agricultural areas or to uh, volunteer in certain places. Mm -hmm. I think it just depends on how the educational curriculum is set up and if people are open to working outside of the box. And that's what our education system has been, is we've been boxed in. And once we start taking students out of that box and taking them to the actual that's where they're going to learn it, is doing the ASEC, is working, cleaning the ASEC, is uh, watching, you know, people that are doing it in the urban areas where they're doing gardens in the cities, I mean, New York, California, everywhere. Yeah. I think that's where we're going to reach the young, uh, younger generation. Yes, absolutely. And you had a comment? Um, I think we make a mistake when we put the responsibility on the schools, which carry so much responsibility for doing all kinds of things in our culture. This whole issue is really a political issue. And that's where our generation comes in. I mean, the question is, to me, what can we do to turn our politicians into more responsive, thoughtful, uh, far-seeing um, citizens so that they use their role to do what needs to be done. We've got 10 years, I understand, to turn around the whole fossil fuel thing. Yeah. And that's not for the, for the elementary school kids to do. No, it's that's not. That's us. Yeah. That's us, that's us going to legislators, whatever it involves. It's us in the streets, maybe even. Us really, really taking that seriously. That's exactly right. I think also because we have the oil and gas have such a strong, powerful voice in in our legislature that it it just it, it's difficult. It is difficult. I'm not going to lie to you about that. Um, but they do listen. They will listen to something that will have an economic impact on our families. They will listen to that. And then I'll. <laughs> yeah, why don't you go ahead? Speaking of voting and politicians, President Trump has declared quite clearly he does not believe in climate change. Yes, we know that. <laughs> he has sidelined science, clearly. Well, I didn't hear the debate, but I heard it in the debate. It was never brought up about the environment. So, what is that telling us? We have a, a leader who is well, is in love with oil and gas. It's not even a leader, and, it's just people who ran the debate. They never brought yeah. it up. And it is setting us, feel. yeah. It's setting yeah. us back. It certainly is setting us back. But we have the power to change that in the next election. We can do it. We can do it. I, I'm, I'm just saddened that we are where we are today. Um, but it's also a, a wake-up call, too, that, you know, we fell asleep. We did. Our policymakers fell asleep. They were not on top of it. So. Just want to say one more comment, Kathy. <coughs> Your presentation is wonderful to help 
might be conscious of this. There's a lot of people who aren't conscious of this stuff about the time to call through climate change. And I think your presentation is very valuable. You know, I've heard so many presentations, I think I got so tired of hearing so many presentations about renewable energy, and you just can't imagine the money that's been poured into New Mexico from environmental groups. And they talk about renewable energy. Yes, we need it. We absolutely need it. But there's no discussion about our heritage. There's no discussion. It's easy to talk about the floods and oh, we don't have any water, but they don't have a value proposition connected to that. And I got so tired of it. So when, when Ann said, you know, we want to hear from you, and, and uh, I thought, oh, this is my opportunity to put something together about our heritage because it belongs to all of us. Anybody that's living in New Mexico that calls New Mexico their home, this is their heritage too. Oh. So I don't know if I missed it, but do you have an article anywhere that, that you gave a lot of information? Well, I, I, do have, uh, um, I do have something I could leave with you about, um, mostly about heritage sites that are at risk that might give you some, some information. But there really isn't anything out there um, that I know of that's been published to talk about this. So that's my next journey. To get to get that published, yeah. Thank you very much.